Um, half of me is British, uh, Welsh to be exact. Uh, the other half is from Sri Lanka. Uh, now I'll be talking about Sri Lanka tomorrow uh, because uh, Sri Lanka has been in economic meltdown uh, this year. You may have seen it uh, in uh, newspaper and TV headlines. Uh, so I I'm going to talk about what went wrong and what lessons there are for other countries around the world. That's for tomorrow. Um, so half of me is Sri Lankan. I, I was born and grew up in Sri Lanka. Uh, my father is from Sri Lanka's Muslim community, which is about 10% of the population. So I was born and brought up as a, as a Muslim. Hence my first two names, which are Mohammed Razin. Um, and um, I have 20, 25 years of work experience in different parts of Asia. Uh, as Bob mentioned, I uh, taught at the National University of Singapore for uh, just over 10 years, uh, until a couple of months ago. Uh, and I've, I've worked either as an academic or a consultant or a think tanker uh, in uh, different parts of Southeast Asia, a bit in mainland China, um, out in Australia, Japan, and also in, uh, in, in, in India, in addition to Sri Lanka. So uh, what, what I'm going to try and weave together um, is, uh, is a sort of mosaic of the Asian experience with economic freedom, economic performance, um, and focus in particular on these two very different countries and societies. China with a population of 1.4 billion. Um, you know, outsiders tend to think of China rather homogeneously. Uh, but given the vastness of the country and its population, you know, once you scratch the surface, you really have to start differentiating uh, China because there are many Chinas, not just one China, is one way of looking at it. And you could say the same of India, which is a continent unto itself. Very, even more diverse than China. Um, and then Singapore, with a population of only 5.7 million. Singapore is a city-state. Uh, I can tell you it felt rather strange being stuck in Singapore for 15 months during COVID, because while other people in the rest of the world, even though they might not have been able to leave their countries, could go from a city or a village or a town to somewhere else in the same country, I couldn't. Uh, I was stuck in one city for 15 months. Not a bad city to be stuck in, uh, but it did feel rather claustrophobic after a while. Um, before I get to those two countries, um, I'll, I'll, I'll start with uh, some very broad historical context on, on, on Asia. Um, uh, the story that uh, you might have already heard or you will, in the course of time here often, is of Asia's economic re-emergence. Now, if we take a very broad historical sweep, and by the way, I will leave plenty of time for discussion, that's the most important thing, but if you want to query any point or, get, or uh, elaborate on something, just feel free to put your hands up while I'm, while I'm talking. Um, if we go back, say, a thousand years, and let's say we start the clock around the year 1000 AD, if, and if we look at a map of the world then, the center of economic and political gravity in the world was actually the Eurasian landmass, all the way from the Mediterranean Sea to the Chinese Empire. Europe was an isolated backwater at the time, and other parts of the world, were not known except to what we now call First Nation peoples, but undiscovered or yet to be discovered by the West. What we saw in the subsequent, let's say, seven to eight centuries on, until the Industrial Revolution, say from 1000 AD to around 1800 AD, was Europe to begin with, and then its offshoots, North America in particular, uh, some or other awakening from their slumber and forging ahead while much of Asia started to stagnate. The Chinese Empire, uh, 
the different kingdoms of India, uh, the breakup of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the Ottoman Empire, its weakness and then breakup and so on. So by the time of the Industrial Revolution, we already saw the West, as it were, overtaking Asia. It had happened before the Industrial Revolution. And then what happened after the Industrial Revolution was what economists call the Great Divergence. Roughly from the beginning of the 1900s until, let's say, the mid-20th century, as this chart shows, um, uh, if you start at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, around 1820, when it was really getting going, you see Asia accounted for about 60% of the world's output, roughly equivalent to its percentage of the world's population. But notice that dramatic decline. So by 1950, Asia, and that of course includes China and India, accounted for less than 20% of the world's output, while the West had charged ahead. Now, Asia's economic re-emergence is effectively what happens from 1950 until the present, with that Asian percentage of world output increasing. Uh, so it starts with Japan and then the so-called East Asian tigers, and then come China and India, and Vietnam and others, until, and these are projections by the economic historian Angus Madison, by 2030, Asia will account for over half the world's output. In other words, coming closer to its proportion of the world's population. Right? So in a nutshell, or in a snapshot, that is Asia's economic re-emergence in the last half century or so. And of course, most recently powered by China in particular. And we can break that down into China, India, and Japan. So China already, if you look at it in terms of um, measuring economies at purchasing power, China is already number one, bigger than the United States, though not yet at market exchange rates, two different ways of measuring economic output. Um, so China, almost one-fifth of world GDP at purchasing power parity. India, under a tenth. Uh, Japan, less, of course, because its population is much smaller. Um, but one crucial caveat to all of this, now and for the foreseeable future, 2030, 2040, 2050 and beyond, the world is going to be in a kind of anomalous situation historically because in a decade or so, most likely, the two biggest economies in the world will be China and India at purchasing power. But they will still be considerably poorer than the West. That's going to continue for at least several decades, even at the most optimistic, with the most optimistic projections for growth rates in China and India and so on. So living standards in China are probably less than a fifth they are in the United States. In, cert in India, certainly much less than a tenth of what they are in the United States. Uh, so it's going to take a very, very long time, if ever, for there to be you know, real convergence uh, to, for Chinese and Indian living standards and indeed living standards in other parts of Asia to come anywhere close to where they are in the West or Israel or, or the Gulf states for that matter. Um, so th that's just a quick historical snapshot. One other background point I, I really want to stress before I go into China and Singapore is really about Asia's diversity. It's difficult to generalize about Asia, although many people do, because it's probably more diverse than any other continent in the world. If you think Europe is diverse, it's really nothing compared with Asian diversity. Um, and that, of course, is something you can see at various levels, political, economic, historical, cultural, religious, and so on. But let me focus here on economic diversity. And what I'm going to show you here is the economic map of the world uh, that the World Bank provides. Um, it's, it's at least a first cut impression into living standards around the world. And what the World Bank does, it's 
is that it divides the economic world into four categories. The, the darker green color is the rich world. Right? Per capita incomes of above $12,000 uh, is the World Bank's measurement. Right? The paler green color is so-called upper middle income countries. You know, I'll, I'll call it the middle world and for Asia, middle Asia. So those are countries with per capita income of between $4,000 and $12,000. Then we come to the pale purple colored bits. Those are lower middle income countries, per capita income of, what is it, between $1,000 and $4,000. That's still pretty poor. So for Asia, I would call that poor Asia. Then we come to the really poor countries in the world per capita income of $1,000 or less, that's really poor. Um, and as you see on this global map, that's now mainly sub-Saharan Africa, Syria, Afghanistan, and North Korea. It's a testament to, if you like, to the success of economic freedom around the world, that whereas if we go back only maybe one or two generations, that deep purple color would have been splashed across most of the planet. Now we see it reduced to particular pockets of the planet. So let's see how that economic diversity applies in Asia. Um, and as you see this, it's vast. Rich Asia is the oil producing countries of the Middle East, some of them, not all of them. It's Saudi Arabia, it's Oman and the Gulf states, plus, of course, Israel. And then, for my purposes, more relevant, because I'm talking about parts of Asia beyond the Middle East, rich Asia, effectively equivalent to Western living standards, is effectively that Northeast Asian pocket of Japan, South Korea, but definitely not North Korea, Taiwan, and as you see, this is quite interesting. Um, the World Bank, probably for political reasons, has not colored Taiwan in deep green. Uh, it should be, because Taiwan's living standards are uh, roughly around South Korea's living standards uh, and a multiple of living standards in mainland China. Um, and not on the map, but still part of Asia, Australia and New Zealand down at the bottom. So that's rich Asia. If we go to the other extreme of very poor Asia, what we have left is Afghanistan, for reasons that will be familiar to you. Uh, we have North Korea, probably the most economically unfree country on the world, in the world, the last remaining command economy in the world. Um, and that's about it. Then we come to Poor Asia, which is lower middle income, per capita income of roughly 1,000 to 4,000. So that's still m nearly all of South Asia, especially India, population 1.3 billion, and pockets of Southeast Asia, for example, you know, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, Indonesia, and the Philippines. That's quite a big chunk of Southeast Asia, still relatively poor. And then in between, we have countries that are categorized as being in the so-called middle-income trap, which means they're neither rich nor poor. Uh, they've made huge advances, uh, but there's the risk that they won't make the transition from being middle to rich. And uh, in Asia, that's, in the parts of Asia I'm talking about, that's effectively three countries. It's China, countries that are colored pale green. China, Malaysia, and Thailand. Um, and I'll talk about this more when I come to China specifically, but they have particular challenges that are more complicated than if you're simply a poor country. What I want to talk about next is, is really about the climate of ideas. So let's bring economic freedom, and I'll use economic freedom and economic liberalism interchangeably. Yes, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. Not at all. China is a very big country. How, how do you measure the entire population and income capacity in terms of 
I guess there are very high inequality and yeah. most of the people are very poor and some of them are very rich and the average is not the reality. I'll give you a, a two-level answer. First, the first level is if we take China as one. Um, there's a chart I'll show you later on which just shows how much living standards have improved in China since the opening began in 1978. So we're talking of living standards in China that have probably multiplied, multiplied about 15-fold in now, uh, what is it, uh, 40, 45 years. Right? Um, so a huge increase in overall living standards. With that, yes, an increase in inequality. So if you look at the Gini coefficient as a first cut, uh, it's probably about 0 0.4, 0 0.45 in China, which is relatively high. Um, but the overall story is because growth has been so fast, up until recently, 8 to 10% a year. Just think of that in terms of compound rates. Average living standards are increasing so much that we've seen a huge lifting of all boats, if you like. Uh, because absolute poverty, if you look at it whichever way, $1 a day, $2 a day, uh, according to the World Bank measurements, has almost been abolished in China. You know, it's down to less than 5%. Right? So absolute poverty has disappeared, which is probably the biggest success story in economic history in the last three, 4,000 years of uh, recorded and impressionistic history. Uh, a big and increasing middle class. So again, you can measure the middle class in different ways. One way of measuring it is to say people who are living on or earning between 10 and $100 a day are middle class. So that number in terms of ab absolute numbers and also in terms of the percentage of the population has thickened enormously in China, big middle class. Uh, so that's how I would summarize it in terms of China as a whole. Um, yes, more inequality, but alongside the abolition of poverty, a widening middle class, but, and of course an increasing number of super rich, a kind of creamy layer at the top. Let's divide China geographically because this is where it becomes more interesting and differentiated. There are probably geographically three different Chinas. So the first is the 10 provinces along the coastline, roughly from Beijing going down the way on, along the coast all the way to Guangzhou, the old canton. By the way, if you take a high-speed train, you can probably do that journey in about 10 to 12 hours now. Um, you can, before COVID, you could have taken a train all the way from Hong Kong to Beijing. Um, those 10 provinces have a per capita income that's probably the equivalent of the poorer countries of the European Union. That's how far China has advanced. So these are already high income uh, parts of the world. Now, I mean, that, it, that's not middle Asia, that's rich Asia, those pockets. And those are still the economic engines of China, particularly around Shanghai in the Yellow River Delta and around Guangzhou in the Pearl River Delta, with Hong Kong very much as an attachment to it now. Then there's a big middle of China, the interior provinces, which are still pretty densely populated, uh, where living standards are much lower, but still probably middle income. So that's middle Asia. Living standards may be, let's say, about half to two-thirds what they are in the coastal provinces. Um, but if you think of it, for those of you who've done basic trade economics, if you think of it in terms of comparative advantage theory, that's good for China because it means the production that's no longer possible in the richer provinces because labor and other costs have increased so much in real terms can actually move to these places and now with very good infrastructure between the two. And then finally, there's, or thirdly, there's, a part of China that's geographically vast but thinly populated, mainly with minority peoples, 
you know, including the Uyghurs of uh, Xinjiang province. Much poorer, more resource dependent, with less of an engine based on manufacturing and services. And then I would add a fourth China. Economists always like to complicate things. Uh, a fourth China is what's in the northeast. It's the old Manchuria, the rust belt of China, the equivalent of, say, Michigan, parts of the United States. Uh, poorer with declining industries, big role of the state, um, and a big burden economically and environmentally for the government in Beijing. So that's the long answer. <laughs> okay. um, sorry, where, where was I? Yeah, um, let's bring in the role of ideas here because uh, what the, the, the question I want us to think about is well, what role has economic liberty, economic freedom, economic liberalism, whatever you like to call it, played a role in this re-emergence of Asia? Um, and I think the answer is quite complicated. It's not straightforward. The first point I would make is that Asia has imported its ideas about how to organize not only the economic world but the political world from the West both collectivist ideas and liberal ideas. And to get a sense of these ideas, uh, I, want, I would like us to take a look at The Worldly Philosophers, which is the title of a book by Robert Heilbronner, which is um, probably the first economics-related book I ever read. Um, and I'm going to lay out visions of the market economy or capitalism. Can you recognize these mugshots, by the way? These Three bearded men and one other. Okay. So in the top left-hand corner we have Adam Smith. Adam Smith. And below him? No idea? Famous German? Not a liberal economist? His name is Friedrich List. And I will be mentioning him later. Then, of course, top right? Karl Marx. Karl Marx. And bottom right? Max Weber, very good. Uh, and then one final mugshot for you, which some of you, I think, may recognize. Famous Viennese economist, Joseph Schumpeter, who, in, who coined the term creative destruction, gales of creative destruction. So there are, there's a long menu, of course, but let's take a short menu of four or five visions of capitalism which apply to Asia. First is Adam Smith's vision, which you get from reading The Wealth of Nations. And it's basically economic freedom. Adam Smith's term for it is natural liberty. In other words, removing restrictions on people so that they can produce, consume, and do all sorts of other things uh, as they wish, providing they don't interfere or harm with others. And that does apply to Asia, but in a more complicated way than uh, many would think. The German political economist Friedrich List I bring into play here because he has been very influential in Asia. Uh, he wrote his book, The National System of Political Economy, as a reaction against Adam Smith. His argument is you need a strong government, a strong state, to guide the economy, not to command it totally, so it's not... It's not a Marxist-Leninist vision, but to guide it, particularly to promote young infant manufacturing industries. Right. So it's very much about an active, interfering state. Listians would call it an, an enabling state. And it has been influential uh, also in the last few decades of the East Asian miracle. So Friedrich List is a, a popular figure in intellectual and even policy circles in countries from Japan to China uh, to India and beyond. Then we have Karl Marx who of course wanted to overthrow the system, not rework it and usher in something else and via Leninism of course Marx has been very influential particularly in Mao's China, also in India until 1991 and other places besides. With Max Weber, we have a more cultural explanation of how capitalism flourishes. 
There are equivalent cultural explanations in Asia, the most famous being Asian values. Um, if I was sitting here as a student going back 30 years, I would have heard much more about Asian values, particularly Confucian values, and how can they are a superior way of delivering superior economic performance. Uh, still quite fashionable, still popular, particularly uh, with some explanations of Chinese success. And then very finally, we have Joseph Schumpeter, who, uh, starting very much as a market-oriented economist, introduced the role of technology, the role of ideas, more broadly speaking, into how economies become innovative and where innovation becomes the engine of an economy. And Schumpeter had his whole theory about that. Um, there is a very big debate going on in Asia right now, particularly with respect to China, on the way the Chinese system organizes technology and innovation, right? and whether it is superior to a Western model, if you like. Right? So I bring Schumpeter in because technology and innovation are, very, are very, a very important part of this picture. Um, so. Economic freedom in Asia. Uh, my basic interpretation is that the role of ideas, the ideas of Adam Smith, fast forward to the 20th century, the ideas of Friedrich von Hayek, of Milton Friedman and others, have not been much, very influential in Asia. So the kind of discussions that some students at least have in the West, or have had since, say, say, since the 60s and 70s, um, that you're having now at this seminar, um, or at your college, for example, uh, you hardly find in Asia. Um, and I've not seen much of it in my 20 plus years traveling around and uh, researching and teaching in Asia. So in that sense, the direct impact of liberal economic ideas uh, has, I think, been much less impactful in Asia than it has been, for example, in Latin America, uh, and certainly compared with the West. That said, I think economic freedom in practice has been influential in Asia and has changed the course of events, but more by deeds than by words. Uh, so you've had um, key leaders like Deng Xiaoping in China from the late 1970s or Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore who probably haven't read Hayek or Friedman but who've seen that previous practice in their countries has failed and who have considered themselves ultimate pragmatists. And pragmatists generally say, we don't have ideology, we'll do whatever works. Tony Blair says that, for example. Bill Clinton used to say that. So in a similar vein, you've had the Deng Xiaopings and the Lee Kuan Yews of this world in Asia who've seen their economies, their societies fail, and then seen what's been working elsewhere. So it could be Chile in the 70s, uh, or it could be other Latin American experiments. It could be the opening up of Eastern Europe after the Berlin Wall fell down could be Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher in the West. They've taken a different course of action, liberalized their economies, and produced better results. So through pragmatism, we've seen a kind of economic liberalism uh, rippling through, through Asia. Some historical examples I would point out, but let me, let me go to talk a little bit about the broad Asian experience post-1945. So it starts, again, if we go back to this map, with uh, an East Asian miracle. So it starts post-1945 with Japan, and then with South Korea and Taiwan, Hong Kong and Singapore. And then come the 1980s, uh, we have Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, more recently Vietnam, come the 1990s India. Um, and 
what we see starting with Japan is even though governments remain pretty interventionist with the singular exception of Hong Kong they effectively liberalize in other words they take away restrictions like lowering trade tariffs removing price controls um, lowering budget deficits generally having policies on inflation that are more stringent than they are in other developing countries um, latching on to trade trying to industrialize through trade becoming export powerhouses opening up in some instances to foreign investment all of these measures you can think of as if you like Smithian measures negative acts where you're taking away restrictions and allowing producers and consumers to operate not absolutely freely but more freely than they used to so I, I think that's it's not the total story but it's I think central to the story of the the East Asian miracle which is why some countries have become rich others have gone from being poor to middle income others have gone from being very poor to uh, to poor um, okay um, one last background point before I come to China the trend I've been describing of if you like a gradual increase in economic freedom applied I think roughly until the global financial crisis so until about 15 years ago what we've seen since then say roughly from 2008 to the present is a reversal not a wholesale reversal but we've seen increasing illiberalism around the world in the West and the rest and Asia is no exception to that so that liberalizing and globalizing trend I think has begun to be reversed in the last 15 years in Asia as well and it starts with China so that's my segue into talking about China in, in particular but before I launch into China do you have any, uh, any points you want to raise based on what I've talked about so far which is really the broad historical context. Go ahead. You, you said that you haven't heard uh, people talking about more of like uh, liberal mm. ideas. Is it also on the, on the upper uh, fortile, like uh, uh, Japan and, and uh, yeah. Singapore and South Korea? Because they are very Western. Yes. Um, my answer is, is yes, uh, that my experience of these countries, Singapore, which is what I, I know best because I lived there for quite some time, but also on visits to Japan and, and Korea, I would say pretty much the same as I would of, um, of India and China and the poorer countries, that even if you look at the elites, the academic stroke intellectual elite, and the policy or governing elite very rarely would you hear mention of Friedman or Hayek or even of Adam Smith and the Wealth of Nations um, you would probably hear the names of Liszt and Marx and Weber more than those in the economic liberal camp but when it comes to actual practice at least until the global financial crisis you would have found the same policy makers saying well, it's good to liberalize um, yes we need to get our tariffs down from 15 percent to 10 percent we need to get rid of these non-tariff barriers we need to race up the world's bank do doing business rankings we need to simplify our licensing system why are we having these price controls and so on and the answer they would give is well it's not because I've read this in Milton Friedman's free to choose it's because well I've seen this done elsewhere on my visits um, and this is what Mrs. Thatcher did this is what Ronald Reagan did this is even what Bill Clinton did in the 1990s um, and it seems to have worked better there than it's been working with our old policies here so let's change let's try something different let's experiment and see if it'll work right. that's generally been if you like the in quotation marks pragmatic attitude yeah. uh, okay so let us launch into uh, China.
Right. So this is a chart that I think I flagged up a little earlier. It just shows, if you look at the right hand, sorry, the left hand side of it, uh, how fast Chinese living standards have increased in the last few, well, from the mid 1990s to the point where China is close to being a rich country, at least by the World Bank's classification, $12,000 a year. No. It's not quite there yet. And this chart, which, which is from a McKinsey Global Institute paper, gives a kind of info, mini infographic on how important China is. 10% of world's good, world uh, goods trade, uh, about a fifth of the world's Fortune 500 companies, the third biggest financial power in the world, second biggest in terms of R&D spending and so on. But notice some of the small print. You see on many indicators, China is actually less globalized than the West in terms of financial flows, in terms of uh, uh, Chinese companies, foreign exposure, and so on. Um, Four, I think, headline points I, I want to make about China to begin with. Firstly, population 1.4 billion, opened up since 1978. It's not surprising, um, given the opening and the globalization of China, that China is now one of the big three powers in the world, whether you consider it economically or politically, meaning that what happens domestically reverberates around the world. So that's true of the United States. It's true of the European Union, if you take it as one. And it's true of China. Second point, Asia now revolves much more around China than it did even a decade or 15 years ago. So if you look at most countries in Asia, their major trading partner is now China. It's no longer the the United States or the European Union. Third point, after the global financial crisis, while China continued to grow fast and the West stagnated, the gap narrowed even further. And the final point, which I think is the really crucial one, because of China's size and importance in the world today, it is no longer, if you like, a rule taker. It is not in the business of accepting rules made by others, made by the West. Rather, for the last 15 years or so, and particularly under President Xi Jinping, it is in the business of setting its own rules of the game for the outside world in competition with the West. And those include alternative economic rules, right? most of which are illiberal, not li liberal, but I will come to that. Um, I'll take you quickly through um, some of the main features of uh, what's been happening in China on the economic front. The main engine of globalization in China has been trade and foreign investment. So you had probably the biggest opening to the world the world has ever seen in the 1990s up until, say, the mid-2000s. Uh, a huge opening of uh, liberalization of domestic barriers. So you had the integration of a domestic market in China for the first time in history by removing those domestic barriers. And then liberalizing trade, opening China to foreign investment. China then inserting itself into so-called global supply chains or value chains. So, I mean, headline example of that is this. So uh, uh, in the last 15, 20 years, most of these electronic devices have been manufactured in China at the final stage of production. Right? Most of the value added comes from elsewhere. But you have these complicated supply chains to uh, export to a global market. So all of that happening in China. Um, but what I would add is that since the global financial crisis, and particularly in the last decade of rule under President Xi Jinping, we have gone, we have seen China go from, if you like, more of a Smithian trajectory of liberalization to more of a Listian trajectory 
of deliberalization. And I think that's very much the story of China in the past decade. So we see higher barriers on trade, on foreign investment, uh, on public procurement, on standards, a whole host of other issues, where the state has designated parts of the economy it considers to be strategic, like financial services, uh, much of high tech, um, a lot of heavy industry. Um, and these are sectors where there are state-owned companies, where private sector companies are very much state-controlled or state-influenced, where you have high barriers to imports, uh, controls on foreign investment, and so on. And a lot of subsidies, huge industrial policy in terms of subsidies going to these sectors. Go ahead. Uh, my question is uh, why China keeps the value of uh, its currency uh, keep it uh, yeah. uh, the same in front of the dollar. Why the, they don't uh, give the market power to do it? Uh... Okay, I, I think there's a... Ultimately, it's a the explanation I'm going to give is political. Yeah, and but I think it, it will occur uh, uh, yeah. uh, earlier or, uh, or later, sooner or later, it, it will hurt the, the economy. Yeah, yeah, I think... So it's in the medium to long term, well, short, medium, and long term, it is economically. This is. I have this on uh, a slide coming up, but the basic story is that even though China has liberalized in other areas, which are not considered politically threatening, so opening the market to Apple is not going to lead to the overthrow of the Communist Party in Beijing. But opening up the financial system might in the, in the minds of the leadership in Beijing. So the financial system has always been treated differently from most of manufacturing in China, which means the financial system, even despite all these decades of liberalization, has remained very much in the hands of the state. The big four banks, which are among the four biggest in the world by capitalization, are state-owned. Their heads are appointed by the political leadership, and they carry a certain rank in the Communist Party and in the government. Right? The four biggest insurers are state-owned. The government used to control and now semi-controls the main interest rates. At the same time, this is your point, the government also has capital controls on foreign exchange uh, so that it can control the currency relative to other currencies. Now, there are economic arguments given we need to do this because we need to keep the domestic system stable, we don't want to have a global financial crisis, and so on and so forth. Some of those arguments in the short term may have some economic legitimacy, but ultimately, if China wants to be a financial power, well, two things. If China wants to have an efficient translation of savings into investment domestically instead of wasting capital as it does, it needs to have a currency that's fully convertible or close to it internationally. Right? If it wants to become the world's key currency, or at least to compete with the dollar in terms of international transactions, it needs a currency that's convertible on the capital account. But it's not doing that. Ultimately, more than for economic reasons, for political reasons, because it's about control. If you do that, then your, your, your taking away, you're taking away your political control of the markets, of the capital markets in particular. And the, right. the export advantage uh, will be gone. Right? Well, th 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 that export advantage, the answer is complicated there. In, in the short, in, in, while economies are growing, Often they have currencies that are valued cheaply or are undervalued. It tends not to last. And then over time, as economies mature, currencies mature with it. In China, it's different because the currency is repressed. But at the moment, the, the currency is, is not, does not have that advantage for manufactured exports as it used to have. And in the long term, it doesn't make any, any economic sense. But ultimately, as I said, this is a political calculation.
they're not liberalizing the financial markets, stocks, bonds, and the external market in any significant way because they fear that this is the slippery slope to losing political control. Yeah, but just the last thing, I think in the, eventually it will be the, it will be much more crisis than if the, if they'll just uh, uh, suffer a bit from inflation and the, the strong currency for... You know, I, 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 mean, I agree with you. I, I think it's definitely storing up problems for China in the medium to long term. It increases the chance that you'll have maybe a bigger crash yeah, bigger in the crash. financial market. Yeah. But at the, if I were to try and put myself in the shoes of whoever is making decisions in Zhongnanhai in Beijing, which is difficult enough, mm -hmm. uh, I think their attitude is we have this situation under control. We've been so successful so far. Our policies are superior. Um, we will deliver the goods. We will keep the population happy, and we will remain in power. That's the way they're thinking at the moment. Um, and that, 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 that there may be something fundamentally wrong to that analysis. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes? Like, I have a point. Uh, like, uh, when you said that the Chinese argument to like, keep control in the financial system is, at least for the short term, to keep things stable. But like with the with the mortgage crisis that's happening yeah. now in China, is it like, is this argument still going on, or is, 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 could could the, could the actual situation actually change something in the near future? The middle, sure. Um, so uh, your your question was was about the crisis in China's housing market at the moment, yeah. and uh, is it leading to policymakers uh, thinking differently about how to regulate financial markets generally? The answer is no. Uh, what they're doing is they're gradually bailing out uh, the real estate market, uh, which is huge. But they think they have the resources to deal with it. Uh, but what they're not contemplating is to change the system or, change, or have a radical change of regulation for the reasons I gave earlier. OK? Um, so. That gives you a sense of, if you like, enduring illiberalism, certainly in the financial market, um, uh, and increasing illiberalism in manufacturing, also in services. Um, one key status feature of the way China does business is through the Belt and Road Initiative, right, which is this here. Uh, we're talking of hundreds of billions of dollars now dwarfing what the World Bank and other international organizations give. It's done in a very status way because it's essentially government-created money through policy banks with Chinese companies doing the construction on big projects. In states around the world, China effectively wants to, maybe control is too strong a word, but uh, be first friend is a more diplomatic way of putting it, including my, my own Sri Lanka. Right. So that's very much about China's external economic projection and done in a very illiberal way. Uh, we see something similar in the um, energy market. The big Chinese companies are state-owned. Uh, they don't operate according to spot prices on international markets. They have other ways of doing business. China and Russia, of course, now have a much stronger energy relationship as a result of what Russia is doing in the Ukraine. Um, and one other feature of China, what was a fast growing country with younger people going into the workforce and powering manufactured exports has rapidly turned around into now the world's fastest aging population. So as the saying goes, China is growing old before, it's, before it gets rich. This is going to be another big economic constraint. So um, I want to leave just a little bit of time for Singapore. I'm running over time. Um, to try and sum up the story, the economic story of China over the last few decades, and particularly what's been happening in the past decade under Xi Jinping, first point, growth is becoming much more complicated in China. 
Generally speaking, if you're in your first stages of growth, from say very poor to poor, what you need is some basic economic freedom, removing some key restrictions. You can do that under a variety of political systems. That's what the historical record tells us. You can even do that with quite a bit of corruption and with institutions that are relatively weak. But providing you can remove those restrictions to get more labor and more land and more capital into the system, you can deliver pretty high rates of growth and pretty high rates of uh, improving living standards and raise lots of people out of poverty and bring lots of people into the middle class. But it gets more complicated once you get to a middle income level, an upper middle income level, because then growth inevitably slows down. You have less land available, you have less capital available, you have less people available because the population is aging. And a lot of the population don't want to do the kind of sweaty work that parents and grandparents did. And are at the same time maybe averse to a lot of immigration. So what you need to do then is really improve your productivity growth. You need to become more efficient in what you do. You need to have better land, labor, and capital markets. Not only do you need to liberalize your markets for Apple and other products, you need to do things that are more complicated, like deregulate the land market, deregulate the market for banking and securities, deregulate um, the market for labor. Right. Now, the World Bank and the Chinese government came up with a report in 2010 saying, this is what we must do. If China is going to, growth rates are inevitably going to slow down, but in order to keep them acceptable enough to meet the expectations of our people, we need to go in this direction. In other words, a more Smithian direction. What President Xi has done is exactly the opposite in the last decade. He's gone in the reverse direction, and a key indication of that is essentially the state now clamping down on the private sector in China. And the private sector is the real engine of China's growth, and particularly the hard big tech, which is the innovation engine of China's growth. So you see a very different trajectory, not just economically, but it's also much more politically authoritarian, uh, and the two seem to be going hand uh, in hand. And my concluding point about China is that if it continues to go in this direction and all the indications are that it will, then I think it's bad news for China because it probably presages stagnation. Um, it's bad news for Asia and other parts of the world because a China that's not growing as fast as it should and, it's not, and that isn't meeting the expectations of its people who are becoming less free rather than more free is probably a China that will be more aggressive in terms of foreign policy to Asia, to the United States and elsewhere. Right? So that's, um, let, I'll, that's really what I have to say. I could say a lot more about China, but that I think is the essential story from, from my standpoint. Um, now, it's already almost three o'clock. Um, Bob, I will take your advice here. Um, should I carry on to Singapore or shall we stick with China if there is interest? Okay, I will follow orders. So, um, okay, so I'll, I'll talk about Singapore by way of contrast, but uh, there's a lot of stuff I've gone through on China. Uh, it is objectively fascinating and of course uh, hugely important for the rest of the world. Any of that you want to pick up on, um, on, 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 on China? Um, do you think I've got something wrong somewhere, fundamentally? Am I being too much of a pessimist? Go ahead. I just have a question. I Go ahead. Uh, why is uh, she clamping down on the, um, the big tech and, and uh, if it's so productive and, and meaningful? Um, I think one reason is complacency. Um, he's seen the Chinese economy being so successful in such a short span of time 
that he thinks he can get away with it, that um, he can give them orders, but they can still continue to function as they used to, still deliver as much growth, as much wealth, as much of the tax take uh, as they used to. I think that's probably compounded by a set of ideas. I don't know what his economic thinking is in any detailed way, but he is probably an economic authoritarian. He, the advice he's getting is much more anti-free market than the advice Hu Jintao and Jiang Zemin uh, and Zhu Rongji were getting from their senior advisors going back 10 or 20 years. Um, uh, so the advice is much more statist. It's that, well, the West has failed. We've seen that with the global financial crisis. Ergo, economic liberalism has failed. We have a better model. It's superior. You know, we can coordinate resources. We have the intelligence. Um, all this command economy style of thinking. Uh, therefore, we can steer the economy in a better direction than the West and beat the West. There's probably some of that. And finally, ultimately, he's thinking probably how can I stay in power? Possibly for the rest of my lifetime. How can I ensure my people control the levers of power? And how can I ensure that this continues beyond my lifetime and their lifetimes? Right. So ultimately, it's about political control. So I, it's probably a combination of all of those things. Oh. Thank you. Um, thinking about, as you said, the most of the world is affected by China, especially in Asia. If we take the assumption that she will continue on the policy she's doing right now, what other states that are affected by China should do in that scenario, especially when we have the U.S. and China face-to-face yeah. -face and we need to choose in a sense? Yes. Um, well, I think this climate of illiberal ideas globally, compounded by, if you like, the Xi phenomenon in China itself, has reverberated around much of Asia, particularly in countries where China exercises disproportionate influence. And we see that particularly in countries where China has lots of BRI projects, like Cambodia and Laos and Sri Lanka, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow. And uh, that makes these countries more dependent on China financially because it's Chinese loans that are building these projects with Chinese companies. Uh, that leads to a sort of admiration of, in quotation marks, the Chinese model. Um, in the process, local elites are co-opted and corrupted. There's a lot of corruption in, all of these pro in most of these projects, a lot of padding. So that means you have business cronies at one end lining up with business cronies at the Chinese end, and of course politicians who do deals above them. Um, and perhaps a general feeling that political authoritarianism and economic authoritarianism go hand in hand as an alternative model to the West. Sometimes it comes crashing down, as it has done in Sri Lanka, uh, which I will talk about tomorrow. Uh, now, that's, if you like, at one end of the spectrum. At the other end of the spectrum, particularly if you go back to my map of uh, the economic map of Asia, which is not too dissimilar from the... Uh, the richer parts of Asia tend to be the parts of Asia that are not only economically more connected with the West, but also uh, politically. You have many U.S. security allies in that patch of Northeast Asia, plus Australia down there uh, and New Zealand. Um, they're perhaps more immune to this kind of Japanese, uh, Chinese onward march. And then you have lots in the middle, particularly in Southeast Asia, uh, who want to get on equally well with both the United States and China, but are now finding that more difficult and Singapore finds it particularly difficult for reasons I'll go into. Uh, sorry, was, was there? Yes. Uh, and then I'll move on to Singapore. Okay, you, just, uh, you, you explained that China is shifting its policy from a liberal, liberal economic policy 
to a more illiberal one. Yeah. Isn't that an implicit sign of recogni uh, recognition that their model uh, has uh, arrived to its limits and now they need to reshape it? Um, yeah, yeah, yes, I, I, I agree with you. I think it's an implicit sign. Um, but it's a sign that China has arrived at a fork in the road. It couldn't continue the way it did before because growth is slowing down. They need to do something about that. Uh, not to get it back up to 8 to 10 percent, that's impossible, but you know, around the 5 to 6 percent mark as opposed to 2 to 3 percent, which might cause big political problems. But then what do you do when you get to that fork in the road? Do you go down that, if you like, the Adam Smith high road to Edinburgh, uh, where you liberalize further, but then you think that might compromise your political control of the state? Or do you go down that Friedrich List road um, of greater state intervention, uh, more state control of the economy, which you think, I'm, this is not what I think, but what I think they think at the moment, is not only the answer to maintaining political control, but also doing better than the West. Well, that's the road they seem to have chosen, for good or ill. Okay, so let me move swiftly to Singapore, uh, which is a very different uh, kettle of fish. For one thing, Singapore's population, I mentioned this earlier, is 5.7 million. So that's, what is it, 4 million less than Israel, 4 million less than the UAE, thereabouts, and uh, of course still bigger than Bahrain. I don't know what the population of Morocco is. Much smaller than, much smaller than Morocco. So a tiny city-state. 750 square kilometers, that's all. Probably much smaller than Israel. Um, and very densely populated. A uh, bit of background. Um, when Sir Stamford Raffles found Singapore and planted the British flag on it in 1819, what he found were a couple of Malay fishing villages with maybe a, a thousand plus villages at most. Um, and what he turned it into was a global entrepot. And then Hong Kong came along 20 years later. So the ingredients of success for Singapore and Hong Kong, and they were similar, roughly up until World War II, were very much having these islands with no natural resources that were fully open to the world for trade, for capital, and for people. In other words, as close to economic freedom, full economic freedom, as you can think of, on all the major indicators, including the movement of people. So Raffles's vision from the beginning was to have Singapore open fully to trade, to flows of money, and to flows of people. So it had huge immigration. It became an entrepot, essentially processing goods and services from its hinterland, which is Southeast Asia, to the west and the other, way, the other way around. And Hong Kong performed the same function between the west and China, uh, starting about 20 years after Singapore. Then came very destructive Japanese invasions, and then the post-war story. Um, and in Singapore, um, its takeoff probably goes back to around 1965. And three major reasons for Singapore going from per capita income of under $500 a year to now between sixty and $65,000 a year. So Singapore is one of the ten richest countries in the world in terms of per capita income. Um, and as I said, with no natural resources. Right? Uh, and as Lee Kuan Yew puts it in his memoirs, it's a story going from third world to first in one generation. Uh, and without you know, other things to attribute that success to, such as oil. None of that in Singapore. So how was it done? 
to begin with, political stability. Lee Kuan Yew won an election in 1959. He turned a raucous democracy into a managed democracy, somewhat controlled. He clamped down on, on civic and political freedoms. Um, all of that's contested. But on the economic front, the main thing was that he ensured stability, which continues now, 60 years later, under the same government, and with a high degree of technocratic expertise and competence. So stability. Without that, anything else wouldn't have happened. Secondly, crisis. Singapore was kicked out of the Malaysian Federation on August the 9th, 1965, National Day in Singapore. So it was on its own. It didn't have to do compromises with the government in Kuala Lumpur. Thirdly, the economy was down and the British, which employed about almost one-fifth of the adult workforce, uh, because the British had huge military bases in Singapore, said, we are leaving in five years. How do you find employment for one-fifth of your workforce in five years' time. What Lee Kuan Yew then did was open up the Singapore economy, advertising it to multinationals around the world. The first ones to come in were from the United States and Japan. So while other third world countries were nationalizing, and while India was telling Coca-Cola to get out, Lee Kuan Yew was saying, we're fully open. You come. You have full economic freedom. You have an enabling state. We'll make everything simple for you. We'll have a one-stop shop to deal with all your local requirements. And you export to the world, taking advantage of our cheap labor. That's how it started. So it started with basic manufacturing. 15 years later, rising real incomes, it went to more advanced manufacturing, like semiconductors, DRAMs. In the 80s, financial services, 90s, higher-end manufacturing, higher-end financial services. And I'd say for the last 20 years, the economics of Singapore is very much like the economics of London, New York, and Dubai. Right. In other words, a global city. Right. So Singapore has all the features of a global city. So it's basically a, the hub in the region to do mainly services transactions across jurisdictions, across languages, across time zones, not only across Asia, but connecting Asia to the rest of the world. It's what Dubai does for the Middle East with the rest of the world. Singapore does for Asia vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. Still has manufacturing, high-end. Financial services and other services is really now the mainstay of the economy. A lot of immigration, 40% of the population is foreign-born. Global city characteristics, but with one crucial difference. Singapore is a sovereign nation state. London isn't, New York isn't, Dubai isn't. Right. Hong Kong, of course, is now under the thumb of mainland China. Right. And Hong Kong is very different to the old Hong Kong. Okay. Go ahead. Is there Sing Singapore wasn't never part of the Malaysia? And is this area is, isn't under a conflict zone or something? Well, if we go back to the 1960s, there was a brief period, just two years, when Singapore was part of the Malaysian Federation. Uh, and there was conflict in the region. Of course, the Vietnam War was the major conflict. But also you had little local conflicts. So it was not a peaceful region. Um, and so Singapore's answer was essentially to go it alone economically and on the security front to build a very strong alliance with the United States. Um, which continues to this day. Okay. So that's, broadly speaking, the trajectory of Singapore um, uh, over the last uh, few, few decades. Um, and you can look at these charts at your leisure. Um, let me relate this more specifically to economic freedom. Um, now, if you look at the, your, your, your Fraser volume on the economic freedom of the world, you'll see consistently Singapore is either number one or number two. And with good reason. Um, and let, let, let me go through some, some reasons quickly. It's a free port. You have zero tariffs. So 
you can import and export anything, providing it doesn't interfere with national security, and not pay any duty. Right? You can set up a business in a matter of an hour or two in Singapore. Right? The licensing system is very simple. Um, I just got my notification for my last tax return. So for one and a half years of income, I probably pay about 10% of my gross income. I didn't even have to file a tax return. It was done for me automatically by my employer because there are very few exemptions. It's very simple. Uh, even when I did it myself, it took about five minutes. Um, it's a pretty flexible labor market. Uh, full foreign ownership guaranteed. So a mainstay of the Singapore economy is multinationals coming from all over the world. Um, and other things besides. So Singapore ticks all those boxes probably better than anywhere else in the world in terms of economic freedom. But that is not the total story of Singapore. Uh, because it's not... Uh, it's not a free market paradise because the government does have a pretty big role in the economy. So let me now very quickly go through the main ways in which Singapore is illiberal rather than liberal in the economic sense. Um, the government actually owns lots of companies, you know, like as in, is the case in the UAE and other Gulf states. Right? And they are a big part of the domestic economy. They dominate the local financial market. Uh, they're run on reasonably commercial lines, but ultimately the government is the owner. If you're a Singaporean, 20% of your income automatically goes into a state-run savings fund. So it's effectively forced savings. Um, government surpluses go into effectively a sovereign wealth fund. Um, you can't choose where you live if you opt for public housing in Singapore. That's determined according to racial quotas to maintain balances among the Chinese, the Malays, and the Indians. And there are all kinds of micro ways in which the government intervenes. So on the one hand, you have the government really getting the basics right in Singapore, which I think is a big part of its success, but intervening in other ways, including providing subsidies to multinationals. Uh, in particular sectors. So it's a, it's a, mixed, it's a mixed bag. Singapore does have industrial policy. Um, and if I were to summarize the state of play in Singapore today, I'd say that um, its challenges are actually quite a bit more complicated than they were in the early years of growth. So if we think back to the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you had a stable international system under a kind of US protective blanket. You had the world opening up and globalizing. And you had Singapore thriving as a global city. High growth rates and reasonably equitable growth rates because there weren't high levels of inequality. Now it's politically more difficult because one, the world is contested geopolitically, especially between the US and China, and both vie for influence in Singapore with their different models. Secondly, growth is inevitably slower than it was, so it's like growth in developed countries. You're no longer talking 6 to 8% or even 4 to 6%. It's more like 2 to 4%, which means that different constituencies are now arguing more over a pie that isn't growing as fast as it used to. So more contest over distributive shares, more inequality, because it generally it tends to be the people who are better skilled, uh, professionals, the already rich with assets who are doing better than those who are unskilled or semi-skilled. So you have widening gaps. Um, more of a backlash against immigration, not least after the COVID crisis, and so on. So this is becoming more difficult for the government to handle, and the government is tending to become more redistributive, spending more on 
on the safety net, on other welfare measures, while continuing more or less to get those basics right, certainly compared with other countries in the region and, uh, and around the world. I mean, that's how I would, broadly speaking, describe Singapore's uh, challenges. Um, the key difference is this. Now with Hong Kong having been turned into an appendage of China with really the abolition of political freedom, uh, going fast towards the abolition of the rule of law, and increasing economic unfreedom, Singapore is probably left as Asia's only global city. Right? And that's Singapore's really big advantage, as being the one hub in this vast continent which connects the continent to the rest of uh, the world. Uh, okay. Um, right, let, me, let me stop there uh, on Singapore. Uh, yes, go ahead. About Taiwan. Yeah. Um, Taiwan in 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 what in what sense? Uh, you talked about what happened in the Hong Kong and what uh, yeah. the, the the place that uh, Singapore is uh, in it uh, right now. Yeah. And uh, Taiwan, it's kind of uh, on the way to uh, um, become the new Hong Kong. No? That is what Beijing would like. And that is what Taiwanese want to avoid at all costs, um, I think is, is how I would basically sum it up. Um, economically speaking, I'm, one should think of Taiwan as an analog to a Western-style economy. Again, if you, if you look at your index of economic freedom, you will see Taiwan ranking probably quite high. Not among the top. Uh, there are lots of pockets of illiberalism in Taiwan, particularly in the services sector. But if you compare it to most countries in the world, it is economically free. Uh, its trade tariffs are low. It's reasonably open to foreign investment. You can do business reasonably well in Taiwan. It's an exporting powerhouse, particularly in electronics. Um, and it has a vibrant population in the context of a very open society um, and a political system that is, it is a liberal democracy. And the Taiwanese see themselves, that is their self-image. Uh, and they want to be allies with other parts of the world that are like them in those respects. What they don't want to do is to get close to China so that China essentially turns it into the next Hong Kong. Um, because for them it's, I think, a recipe not just for the loss of their personal freedoms, but also for a very different economic model. Um, they don't want that. Uh, the problem, of course, is the geopolitics of this, because as China has grown ever more powerful economically, politically, and militarily, it has put more pressure on Taiwan. Um, President Xi has been, has been banging the nationalist drum more on Taiwan than ever before. So there is the prospect, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but what was fanciful just a few years ago is now at least a plausible scenario, namely that at some point before too long, China will invade or at least impose a blockade of Taiwan, um, try and strangle Taiwan economically and then control it politically and that might draw in other players, the Japanese, the Americans, and others, and that might lead to not just a regional conflagration, but some sort of global conflagration. I mean, that is one scenario. I think the story of China in Africa is similar in many respects to the story of China in Sri Lanka, which I will talk about a little bit tomorrow. Um, so on the plus side, so let, let me try and do this in, in terms of a balance sheet. On the plus side, the Chinese have built a lot of new infrastructure quickly, some of it efficiently, and some of it has been economically beneficial because, you know, usual thing, you build a road, you have businesses that uh, uh, pop up alongside it, uh, you have more urbanization, um, you have more dense economic activity taking place. 
Um, and some of this infrastructure has delivered these results faster and better than what the World Bank and others have aided these countries in doing. So that's perhaps on the plus side. But I think on the negative side, which is perhaps at least as big and probably getting bigger, there are a lot of points to list. Most of these projects have been done in a very arbitrary, non-market way. It's governments doing deals with other governments involving state-owned companies saying, you know, we, we know that this is the right project to do. We know better than the market. This is what should be done and this is how it should be financed. A lot of these projects involve a lot of padding. In other words, markups going into the hundreds of percent. So I know of projects in Sri Lanka where the markup is anywhere between 400 and 800 percent. So that, of course, goes into lots of undeserving pockets. Many of these projects are vanity projects. They're not economically useful. They're, for, in Sri Lanka, for example, you have a port, a cricket stadium, a convention center, an airport, all built at the end of nowhere because it happens to be, happened to be the president's home base politically. Right? Um, and then the country lands up in debt. So you have financial distress in addition to everything else, worse in some countries than others. Among the worst, Venezuela, Zambia, Pakistan, hugely indebted to China. And then finally, if you like, the export of this very illiberal Chinese model, politically and economically, to other countries, uh, where you know, authoritarianism is then given a good name um, or a glossy label. Um, and it ends up corrupting local elites, both political and business elites. So I, that's, to me, that's part of the story of China in Africa. Yes. Uh, um, how how uh, the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy in uh, Singapore is toxic? Um, I think it's, um, well, because <laughs> it's different when you live there. So Singaporeans know, and I know having lived in Singapore as a resident for some time, that uh, sometimes it gets a little bit complicated, but then I think I compare it to elsewhere. What I was used to the, in the UK, what I am used to in Sri Lanka, or most other places in the world I've been to, and I am grateful for having lived in Singapore. Um, so government has remained by international standards relatively small and streamlined and performance oriented. Um, I think for two, two major reasons. Firstly, size helps. If you're a small country whose lifeblood is trade with the rest of the world, and you know that's a matter of survival, that tends to keep not only market actors, but also government on its toes. I mean, not always. I can think of plenty of small countries that have gone in the wrong direction. But the more successful countries in the world economically tend to be smaller. Um, and they have the, the discipline of trading with the rest of the world, which limits excess mistakes, fatal errors domestically, also in terms of government. That's one reason. Second reason, individuals matter. So if Lee Kuan Yew hadn't been there 50, 60 years ago, if he hadn't surrounded himself with the right people and got those basics right, and then built institutions to outlive him and his generation, which survive and perform reasonably well today, then uh, I think government would be more inefficient and the economy as a whole would be uh, less, uh, uh, performing less well than, than it is. Um, I mean, having said that, as I said, Singapore is not a free market paradise. There are the, the main weakness in Singapore, and this is, it bears comparison with, with lots of other countries that perform sometimes even worse in the Fraser Index. The main weakness in Singapore is that it's got a very weak domestic private sector. Uh, so you don't find many Singaporean entrepreneurs. Why? Because they're squeezed by the big multinationals and by this huge domestic government sector which occupies most of the domestic economy. 
So it crowds out space, land, talented uh, labor, and capital for domestic entrepreneurs. Um, so even Singapore has those, those weaknesses, which are probably a result of government overreach.